and welcome to the Tuesday update on high path avian influenza in Ontario. My name is Ashley Hansberger. I'm the executive director for Poultry Industry Council. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, as I've mentioned previously, Poultry Industry Council, we support the commercial poultry industry in Ontario to do education, extension, outreach, as well as research dissemination. Um, but this website, or this webinar series is supported through funding with the Ontario Ministry of Ag, Food and Rural Affairs through the CAP funding. And so we're supporting OMAFRA as well as CFIA to create a platform to share continued information on the avian influenza uh, situation. So as I've said uh, every week, in case you're new, um, this is a really good central resource for finding all of the links, the maps, all of the stuff that you need to know regarding high path avian influenza right now. So this is the Poultry Industry Council landing page. You can use this drop down and check out the biosecurity and disease page. So there's tons of different stuff. Like I said, there's interactive maps. Uh, they're updated on an ongoing basis. Um, we've got all the links to the CFIA resources, the OMAFRA resources, the wild bird stuff. This is just one of the examples from the Ontario Animal Health Network that we think is, is pretty useful. So make sure you take some time to check those out. Uh, so joining us tonight, we have our usual cast of characters. Um, on the speaker roster, first up, we're going to have CFIA speak. Uh, so we've got Binu George now joining us. Uh, next, we're going to have Dr. Lucy Roska. Then we're going to have Brian Stevens give us a little bit of a bird wild bird update. And then we'll round it out with Al Dam and some live question and answer. So as always, if you do have a question, just pop it into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. If you're, a, if you're dialing in from a phone, star nine, that will raise your hand and you'll draw your attention towards us so we can help get your question answered. So I'm just gonna invite Binu to join me here and we'll get going. Thank you, Ashley. Good evening, everybody. And thanks for having me here. It's been a busy week. I would like to reference the CFIA website. As since the last time we got together, there have been five additional sites added in Ontario that we refer to as IPs or infected premises. And now we are up to a total of 25 confirmed IPs in Ontario. We have quarantined all sites and response actions are underway. Maps are updated when a new IP is added or a new primary control zone is developed, so continue to watch that map. It is noteworthy that within those maps, the area is separated into two zones. The primary control zone outline has an approximate 10K buffer. At the center of that 10K buffer zone, there is a minimum 3K infected zone surrounding the site of operations. The two zones have different restrictions and requirements. The Entire primary control zone accounts for the movement of poultry in, out, and through the area. As long as the internal area is called the infected zone, it is prohibited for the placement of poultry. There is, however, consideration of placement of commercial birds within the infected zone of what we consider IPs 1, 2, 3, 6, and 10. And this would be done through our movement and permitting group which is in a position to better direct you on the conditions that would need to be met to place within the infected zones once approved. However, please note that the category of small holding poultry, which would be referred to as under 300 birds for a non-commercial purpose, is still prohibited at this time for placement within an approved infected zone. We will continue to keep you updated on this topic of consideration of placement as conversations continue to happen at both the national and regional level. But again, if there's any specific question, please reach out to the movement control group. The remaining infected zones are still prohibited for the movement of live birds in the infected zone. The map is very useful. It's a highly useful tool that is designed to have an address feature where you can enter the address and it will drop an X into the map, which would help to determine if you are in the broad primary control zone or the infected zone. The website is being continually updated to provide further clarity based on feedback. We are trying hard to make it even more user friendly. There's a new look to the permits and conditions page. It's more of an interactive tool where you can use the drop down boxes to filter what you're looking to move and how you're looking to move that. 
This makes it a little easier instead of searching through the charts. There is also some clarification and information at the bottom once you have filtered what you're looking for. The phone number and email address to reach the permitting group are also on this page to help better set up movements and answer all your permitting questions. I would like to spread awareness that this is spreading across the globe. So AI is spreading across the globe at this point. So anyone with farm animals must practice good biosecurity habits to protect poultry and prevent disease. For anyone interested, there are some great resources on the CFIA website that are designed specifically for owners of backyard flocks and pet birds. There are four documents and links available, and there are five rules to prevent and detect disease in backyard flocks and pet birds. We have, um, we have a protect your flock from bird flu, a general producer guide on farm biosecurity standards and national avian on farm biosecurity standards. Lots of good information for backyard flocks and some detailed information on biosecurity, which is an interesting and highly recommended read. We do respond to sick bird calls and high mortality calls and our sampling teams are following up with these as they come in. So please continue to check the website as we continue to navigate the situation. Our permitting group is working to grant movement permits as they come in, and this has been going very well so far. There are some bumps and hiccups that will happen, but overall the process is moving along. And if you have any questions surrounding the movement of live birds, I encourage you to reach out to the number or email on our website to get the most up-to-date answers for all your permitting questions. That's all I have for you today. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Vinaya. So now we're going to hear from Dr. Lucy Roscoe from OMAFRA. So thank you, everyone, for participating tonight. Um, as usual, I'm going to present you some updates about what, what's happening in Ontario, in uh, Canada, uh, United States, and a little bit about Europe. I'm going to start with Ontario Ministry's order. As you know, um, it was issued uh, back in April and then it was valid until May the 9th. However, um, it has been extended until May 20th. Um, this action is being taken to reduce the spread of highly pathogenic avian influenza in the province, particularly in the small flocks. Um, I do have a website here that you can access and um, look for updates. Um, what are the activities that are not included in the order but are still permitted? Normal businesses carry it out at a slaughter plants operating in accordance with the Food Safety and Quality Act 2001, wildlife rehab centers, pet stores and other permanent retail locations, accredited veterinary facilities, zoos and similar animal experience businesses at the location where the birds are permanently housed in any activities that a person um, is lawfully ex exercising existing, existing Aboriginal or treaty rights. As um, um, my previous speaker uh, talked about it, we do have a 25 Ontario infected premises. Among those uh, seven are small flocks that comprises of ducks, layers, chickens, guinea fowls, and geese. The 18 commercial flocks are divided by, by um, species in like 10 outbreaks in ducks, uh, five in turkeys, one in layers, and two in broilers. I do have some estimated numbers of how avian influenza has been impacted in Canada uh, this year. Um, we have a total of 75 outbreaks declared in Canada. As you can see, Ontario is on the top rank, followed by Alberta, and the rest of the countries involved about with a million and 700,000 birds. And this number only includes only uh, the 68 infected premises reported on May the 5th by uh, CFIA website. What's happening in the United States? Um, the last report that I could take it from their websites um, was on May the 7th. They do have 291 confirmed flocks with 34 affected states. Among that, um, they have 172 commercial flocks and uh, 119 backyard flocks. Birds affected were over 37 million. 
I did put some slides um, in maps about with a uh, small flock by state um, in the United States. At 12 days apart, um, you can see where the darkness is starting to um, get more and more, and that's on May the 7th. Um, you can see also that there is a Alaska has been um, with a case reported. Similar thing for commercial um, um, difference between April 25th and May the 7th. We have additional states that they declared, and this is Utah and um, Oklahoma. The distribution of the um, highly pathogenic um, even influenza H5 and H5N1 between the two times, uh, the period of 12 days, uh, you can see a lot of red dots and yellow dots, which are commercial and non-commercial poultry um, or backyard flocks. Uh, this has been expanded, especially in Canada, and their clusters um, dealt with uh, flyways through Atlantic and Mississippi. What about Europe? Um, we know Europe has been dealing with this since 2021, and then we're looking to take some information from them and see how do they do different than us and how we can, um, we can help our uh, uh, flocks to not get even influenza infected. Um, the number of outbreaks declared um, up to um, April 29 this year were over 1,518 countries. And um, if I compare this number with what they had in total in 2021, over 24 European states, they were a little bit over 1,700. So you can see that the outbreaks are still upcoming and then they are in large numbers. Um, the French government says that the um, even influenza progression is slowing. Uh, while the disease continues to spread in Western France, its progression is slowing and particularly strict measures are put in place to protect breeder flocks and hatcheries. Uh, to control the spread in this region, commercial duck farms are depopulated between a 10 kilometers wide strip. There's been a Dutch study uh, with the laboratory and uh, early outbreaks in poultry flocks were traced back by uh, two different wild birds. However, the ongoing wave of outbreaks in one area of um, this eastern province indicate that the virus was spreading from one poultry flock to another. Evidence came from genetic analysis of the virus isolated from affected farms. Because of that, in the recent weeks, all poultry farms between one kilometer of a known infected zone have been depopulated. And between one and three kilometer zone from known outbreak, the surveillance is intensified in poultry farms and monitoring continuously for 14 days in all premises with poultry in that zone. Also, I can say that the um, cases of highly pathogenic influenza in wild birds are increasing. For the year to date, the outbreaks in wild birds across Europe reported to the European Commission notification system has reached to over 1600 as of April 29th. That's all I have so far. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to invite Brian Stevens to give us a bit of a wild bird update. Thanks, Ashley. Good evening, everybody. Um, so just an update on wild birds. We are still continuing to see cases. Uh, we have started to see a bit of a shift over the past couple of weeks where we're seeing fewer waterfowl affected. Um, and a lot more raptors and scavengers, in particular turkey vultures. We've had approximately 10 over the past two weeks of just turkey vultures alone. Um, so we are seeing a little bit of a shift over there. We're seeing fewer Canada geese at this point, um, which may be good news that the virus is spreading less in those species because the Canada goose was the main species that we saw at the beginning of this outbreak. Um, the other thing that we've noticed over the past few weeks as we've seen it more in corvid species, so crows and ravens, again, another scavenger. Um, and we've started to see it a little bit further north. So we've had a case of a raven in Sudbury um, and we're getting reports out of Sudbury and out of Kenora um, of suspect birds. So it seems like the virus is slowly moving northward as well, which is likely due to the migration of these birds as they move further and further north. The biggest change we've seen is not in wild birds specifically, but we did see a jump into mammals recently um, where we did have two uh, distinct uh, litters of fox kits that were infected with this highly pathogenic strain of avian influenza. 
Um, so red foxes have been known to be susceptible to this virus. Um, there were reports out of Europe um, last year of fox kits being infected with this. And now we've had two cases of it here in Ontario. Um, and probably these foxes are getting it through ingesting the raw meat of infected birds, um, similar to how the scavengers and other raptors are uh, getting this virus as well. Um, and we know that other uh, wild carnivore species are susceptible as well. So we're watching for it in other uh, wild carnivore species too. And the, the signs that we're seeing in those animals are similar to what we see in the wild birds. Um, and that's neurological signs. So these fox kits that came into uh, rehabilitation centers were mostly seizuring um, and exhibiting other neurological signs like that. Um, and that is all the update I have for tonight. I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thanks very much, Brian. And a good reminder, if you have a question, just feel free to pop it into that Q&A down at the bottom here. So now we're gonna invite Al Dam, our provincial poultry specialist to come on screen. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, we are I'm just going to share my screen here. I'm hoping you can see the map. So this is the CFI map that uh, has been that Vinu was talking about. Just wanted to point out that uh, as far as small flocks go, uh, these three here and these three here are small flocks. Um, so you guys are not immune uh, to this issue. If uh, you look at number of IPs that are here, it's it's getting to be a, a fairly big list on this site. You can access this website from the PIC uh, page that you registered on. But uh, as you, as you know, said, it's a very interactive map. If you're trying to figure out if you're in a zone, you can just put in your, your address in there and it'll draw a red X as to where you are. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, there is lots going on. We have uh, a lot of information still on our even influenza page, um, but really, I, I guess I can't stress this enough. This this is a disease right now in the small flocks and the commercial flocks. It's a disease of biosecurity. So whatever you do, uh, do that and then do more on top of that. Um, if you are really concerned, like if you're if you're breeding birds and are trying to make sure that your your Gen X stock is going to be safe. You should be looking at everything from who's coming on your site. Are you disinfecting uh, people and equipment and things and even even vehicles, right? Uh, knowing that um, vehicles can carry this on their tires, you should be spraying your uh, anyone who comes on your, your property or is accessing your, your operation. That being said, hunting season's also started. So there's material out there if you guys are into turkey hunting. Um, and you have birds, be sure, be sure, be sure that you're separating out your hunting stuff from your small flock stuff. And one of the questions I'm getting is uh, why should I even bother, right? Uh, in the case of, and I've heard this a lot, if it's getting in the commercial operations, what choice do I, you know, how am I gonna stop it? Why should I even bother? Well, if you're not gonna do it for yourself, think about the people within 10 kilometers of you that's gonna be really ticked that, uh, you've gone positive because you haven't done anything and now you're impacting everyone in that 10k zone um once again this this map here if you're in these zones as Spinu said there's there is some permitting things that uh can happen and uh from the permitting site here this is how it looks you can you can change it's a drop down menu and you can figure out if you need to have uh, permits or not, or if it's even allowed. So reference that. Uh, and then if you see any issues with your birds, uh, be sure to highlight this line here. If you've got any mortality concerns to call the 226 number. Uh, just looking at what was going on in live bird migrations, this is a really heavy night for wild bird migration. Uh, the weather is coming. It's, it's, we are finally getting some of that nice weather. I hope I hope, I hope that we are gonna get um, the heat that's gonna help address the issue with the virus, but we don't know. And I guess that's my, my concern is that we just aren't sure what's gonna happen this summer. Uh, you guys need to stay safe. I know we're tired of COVID and we're tired of avian influenza, um, but once again, this is a disease of biosecurity. 
uh, when you let your guard down, that's when things are going to go wrong. And, and we're not seeing that change in wild birds. That's why I keep dragging them, Brian, out to these Tuesday night sessions to let you know what we're seeing in the wild bird site, because you guys have probably more interactions with wild birds or more potential for interaction than we have with our, uh, our commercial folks. So uh, with that, I guess we'll turn it back to Ashley. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks very much, Al. So we can kick off the questions. Uh, we did have one come in shortly ago uh, that I'm just going to paraphrase. So this person has been isolating their birds since April 6th in their enclosure, not allowing them to free range. Um, but unfortunately, a confirmed case just occurred near this property, and now they're in a protected controlled zone. So they reached out to CFIA and they asked what do they need to do in order to continue selling farm gate eggs. But at the end of the communications, they learned that they're in a two week quarantine period from selling eggs, despite the fact that they feel like they're doing everything correctly. What options do they have to continue to move the eggs? Can they send them to something like an egg grading station? So they'll have to... Go ahead, Binu. Yeah, so they'll have to wait out the quarantine period and address the issue once that quarantine period is over to get additional information because things could happen within that uh, quarantine period as well with the control zone. So it's always good to ask for permission once that period is over and everything is all right at your own premise. Okay. Thank you. Um, so can we just talk about the ways that AI is spreading? There's a question, does it spread in the air? Can you just talk about that and how else it might spread? I remember when Mike Patrick was on a few weeks ago, he said it spread like magic. I still think that's a good answer. <laughs> um, I'll, let, I'll let Lucy take a crack at it, but you know, it, it is fecal oral, but it is spreading in the environment. It's, it's everywhere. So yeah. Anyways, I'll, I'll let you take it. I'll so imagine, take it imagine this virus is like a protein and it doesn't have its own legs, its own wings or anything like that. So it needs to have a vector in order to be spread. It can be a vector to aerosols. It can be a vector to organic matters that can get attached to anything. If it gets spread by air, yes, but it has to be encapsulated in something to be spread. Um, so let's say, um, yeah, windy day, it may go a little bit farther than normal. Yes. Okay. And so when Al's hammering home this biosecurity stuff over and over, you're thinking maybe a lot of it's coming in through boots or something like that? That's correct, yes. It's up to us. And, and even, and I guess an interaction with wild birds, right? So it, it is getting walked into barns for sure and operations, but it's, it's also a wild bird interaction thing. So we, we've seen it where folks have done everything they, they can possibly do, but then they still let their ducks out to the pond. Mm. Uh, you're, you've just shot yourself in the foot potentially on that, right? So, um, and with the fecal oral, route that it's going through like with ponds and we've, we've had this question before with you know should I let my dog swim in the pond and then come in the coop no right like that's that's a hard no right. um so yeah just think of where wild birds are and where your birds are and how to keep them as separate as possible okay uh so question once a bird is carrying the virus are they infectious forever just curious about those waterfowl that that may be asymptomatic. That sounds like a Brian question or answer. Uh, so yeah, so with influenza viruses in general, they're not going to stick around in the body forever. Typically, um, birds are going to be infected for a certain amount of time, pass it on to other birds, and then it just kind of circulates, similar to how we see the influenza virus in humans every year. Um, so no, a, a bird should not be infectious going forward when they're infected with the avian influenza. They should clear it at some point, um, but unfortunately it often just gets passed around or it's in the environment for a while and picked up by another bird. 
So Brian, so actually maybe we'll pull that string a little bit further. So as far as sensitivity to AI, and maybe, it, and I know in chickens and turkeys, we're seeing a lot of mortality really hard and really fast, but on the wild bird side, what are you, what are you seeing? Yeah, so for this specific virus, because it really depends on the strain of the virus, um, for this specific one, we're seeing some species definitely seem to be more sensitive than others. So Canada geese in particular, seem to be quite sensitive to it. I don't know if that was because there are so many Canada geese out there and that's why we got so many of them. Um, whereas we didn't see it as much in mallard ducks or some of the other dabbling ducks. We've only had a few cases in them. And then when it came to other species, the species that aren't typically uh, infected with this virus, so the raptors and the corvids and other species like that seem to be particularly sensitive to this virus. Uh, so we're just a uh, follow-up question about the foxes you were mentioning. Um, what was the outcome of that? And is that typical? Do we know? So yeah, the foxes is something that we're learning more and more as we get more of these cases. Um, so what we know so far is that the fox kits, so the young ones, these ones that we had were about five to six weeks old. They seemed particularly susceptible to the virus um, and a number of uh, fox kits in those litters did die from this um, and with neurological signs, as I mentioned. But talking with the rehabilitated, it sounds like there have been some that have survived. Um, we don't know if they were infected with the virus. So there's uh, further testing that's being done at this point to see if they actually are and had been infected with the virus. Um, so it seems like some of these foxes could be getting over the virus whether or not they're able to be released in the wild, we don't know yet, um, but further testing is being done at this point on them. Okay. Do you know much about coyotes and whether they can become infected? So theoretically, I would say yes, they probably can become infected. I haven't heard of a case in coyotes yet, um, but they are a wild canid similar to foxes. So theoretically, I can see how wild canids should be susceptible to this um, and we're going to keep an eye on them. We are testing all wild canids at this point as they come in to see if we get any other positives on anyone else. Okay, thank you. Brian, pulling that string a bit further, I can hear your dog barking in the yep. background. Is, yeah, you know, would you be concerned about your, your own domestic canids? Yeah, so I mean, from what I've read about this uh, virus, it can infect domestic dogs, domestic cats. Um, so if any of them are getting into the pond and more feeding on a, a dead duck or goose that's died from it, um, it's likely the best way that they're gonna come across this. Um, so definitely if you do have outdoor cats or dogs that run around the farm, then you wanna make sure that you're watching out for any dead waterfowl on your property because there is a potential that they could pick it up. Um, I don't think there has been a reported case in this outbreak, but there have been cases of uh, domestic cats getting infected with a highly pathogenic avian influenza in previous outbreaks um, across the world. Okay. Um, so a nice comment from David. Thank you for the compliment that we're doing a good job. We're trying our best. Um, and his question, which is in the numbers on commercial flocks, there were 10 duck operations impacted five turkeys and fewer layers and broilers. Are chickens less susceptible or what's the deal with these numbers? All I can say, uh, if you look into United States, uh, turkeys were the most susceptible ones. However, we do have 10 ducks probably because they got close to each other where they got infected from wild birds. So it's a, a matter of who got infected when. I would say. It's not yeah. because uh, ducks were more susceptible, but it just bad luck that they got infected. So, but yeah. as far as when we started to see uh, the poultry infected, lots of turkey uh, being on, on outbreaks in the United States and, and then now in Canada. And, and looking at the numbers in the US too, like there have been a number of layer operations impacted and they will, those have really jumped the numbers of birds that were impacted. So I, I would not think chickens are less susceptible at all uh, in this case. This is, we call it even influenza for a reason, right? Yeah. 
it's just how they got it. Like it's just that they had got infected and lucky them that they got the outbreak. So, right. Uh, so, question uh, for Brian about barn swallows. Have you seen any um, active cases happening in barn swallows? And maybe we can talk about how they might be an issue in the sort of ecosystem of spreading them, spreading AI. Yeah. So, outside of water birds, so waterfowl, gulls, raptors, and corvids, we haven't seen any other species as of now. Um, so, we have tested a few barn swallows and other swallows, um, and none of them have come back positive to this point. Um, we're definitely watching for it because we have seen reports out of Europe and different species of birds similar to barn swallows that have been infected with the virus. Um, so just because it doesn't seem like they have the virus doesn't mean you can let your guard down with them. The concern with any other bird like that, whether it's songbirds like uh, sparrows and starlings, or you've got swallows that are coming around, they can carry the virus potentially on themselves. So they could land in an area, in a pond, in a field with goose droppings, move from one area to another and carry the virus with them. So even if they're not infected with it, they can definitely carry the virus from place to place. Okay. And, and that goes along with your the whole biosecurity message I've been trying to, to pound too, right? Because rodents can be a vector, like lots of things can be a vector. You can be a vector by mechanical transmission. So I think that's what, what Brian's talking about is mechanical transmission versus being infected and and i guess that's that's another reason why if if you were finding some dead birds on your property to call canadian wildlife health cooperative to get those submissions in and at least, at least call and then and then cwhc can can uh, do the triage right right like you're looking at any waterfowl or any or clusters of small birds or anything with neurological issues yeah, yeah. So we're we're really looking for waterfowl, water birds, raptors, corvids, clusters of songbirds and other small birds, um, anything that seems neurological. If you have any concerns about any birds that you find on your property, definitely give us a call. Um, and we can at least go from there and decide whether or not it sounds like it is a case that we're really worried about and want to bring in. I mean, we're not, I mean, at the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative, we're we talk about avian influenza here, but we're looking for everything. Um, so even if it isn't an avian influenza outbreak, we're testing for other things and trying to get an answer for you, regardless that so you have some sort of closure as to what's going on with those birds. And just to let everyone know how serious all levels of government are taking this, like the province is concerned, CFI is concerned, but municipalities are concerned too. They're reaching out to us to talk with their emergency management folks on a constant basis on various regions, look at how do we help address this issue in a particular municipality, whether it's the beaches um, and dead bird pickup to try and get them to Brian or looking at what needs to happen if they're in an infected, infected zone um, or a control zone. So, you know, this is not just a federal issue, this is not just a provincial issue, this is a municipal issue also, and it should be a farm issue for you guys. Right. Okay, we have uh, no open questions. I did a good job tonight. In another minute, to see if anyone else has any burning questions. As I mentioned, the Poultry Industry Council is kind of like a dumping site for all of the links. So if you miss something or if you're curious to see what else you should be checking into, please feel free to check that website out. Um, if you don't have any further questions, we'll just call it a night. We're going to continue the series on for the rest of the month of May. Um, so we're just we're here, and if you have any further questions, reach out to someone on our team. Thanks very much, and everyone, please take care. Until next time. Good night, everyone.